I have a real soft spot for campy horror. Anyone who watched my full review and commentary on the five Final Destination movies last year will be well aware of that. I love to watch legitimate scary ghosts and ghouls horror now and again, but there's something much safer and easier to get behind when it's a little bit silly. The Final Destination series was an important gateway for me to discover horror, and more recently I got into the Escape Room series, and if there were a trilogy of those that's absolutely what I would be watching this year, but I'm gonna hold out hope that a third movie is still coming in that ridiculous franchise. But while trying to brainstorm what I should watch this year, I was reminded of Cube. Released in 1997, this is an independent Canadian film made for a third of a million dollars that has gone on to become a bit of a cult classic. And in 2021, this original movie actually had a Japanese remake, which is kind of interesting to me. It's pretty rare that we're exporting horror films to Japan. I've never seen any of these films, not even a single second. But I think it's a little bit Saw, a little bit Escape Room. But considering when it was released, it's actually a predecessor to both of those. So I think this is actually considered a fairly influential franchise. Which is really cool considering how cheaply it was made. I'm gonna be doing sort of a live reaction commentary over these individual movies, summing up my thoughts a little bit in between, and having a wrap-up at the end. So pop yourself some popcorn, sit back, and let's enjoy some silly Halloween horror together. Oh, so right off the bat, we are within the cube. It would actually be kind of cool if this movie spent zero time outside of the cube. Did this guy show up head shaved in pajamas, or did they do that to him? I actually quite like that he didn't start screaming or calling for help. He's just silently going through the motions of trial and error, seeing what works. What? Oh shit, that's actually a very cool effect. So right off the bat, I probably can't show a lot of the deaths in this series, but that was kind of sick. It didn't even really show that happen, there was just the sound of it ripping its way through. He chose the third of three rooms that he looked into, and apparently that was the wrong choice. I'll be curious to know what the sort of rules are, like if it's a no-win scenario, or if there is some way to work out a proper escape. I genuinely thought that was the classic setup of just showing some intense stuff right off the bat, then we would go to the real world, meet some characters, then they'd all get brought to the cube. Nope. One guy alone by himself, dead, title card, back to more people trapped in the cube. This lady is having the first normal reaction. She's waking out quite hard. We have people crawling around, entering the cube from all over the place. No one knows each other, no one knows what's going on. The camera's actually doing really cool disorienting things, because it's a cube and every wall effectively looks the same. The way it's able to pan around from top to bottom to walls to floor, and, and it just is kind of neat. Holy, holy cats! Is this lady saying holy cats instead of holy cow? This is a, a terrifying situation you're in, lady. I think you can work on your cursing a little bit. This dude who's got a clear head injury, his name is Worth? Ge I've genuinely just never heard of a Worth before. Valma's over here losing her glasses, already managed to crack those. Old timers just hasn't said a word. Immediately man of action, untying his boots, who knows what his plan is. Well, yeah, I guess you don't go into that room then. You can only really do the boot test so many times, though. <laughs> you better hope you don't end up in the wet puddle room or you're gonna have some just soaking wet socks. This lady was kidnapped while eating a pierogi dinner, which makes me wonder what part of Canada this actually was filmed in or made in, because pierogi dinners are actually much more common in Western Canada because of a high proportion of Ukrainian immigrants. I've been to the States, you guys have the worst possible frozen pierogi selection. Just, just spitting facts here, you guys gotta sort that out. It's a great dinner. This guy's all in on the boot. He wants to use the boot exclusively for the motion sensor traps. 
We've established that we have a cop and a doctor in here right now. They could have so easily done the most boring blank walls for this cube. And I like that they went the extra mile to give it this distinct sort of dystopian industrial feel. So, so far they're just chucking boots into rooms and using that exclusively to decide where to go. Not a lot of puzzle solving so far. Uh, Velma managed to discover a code. This lady's talking about how they're gonna starve or die of dehydration in this cube. And so this old man's telling them all to suck on a, a button off their suit now to keep the saliva flowing. They've been in here like 10 minutes and they were already starting to worry about this stuff. This cop has like a ripped sleeve and some bloody stuff going on around his arms and the other guy had his head bashed in. When we first saw them in a room together, there was blood on one of their cube door handles. I'm really hopeful that we circle back around to what happened to these two before they linked up. And now this guy, Ren, is actually an escape artist. He's a professional jailbreaker. I don't know why in God's name he determined that that room was safe. Yeah, campy might be the wrong word for this franchise. That man just had his face burnt off with a blast of acid. There was nothing, nothing very funny about it. Quit looking at it, everyone. It's horrible. <laughs> The effects in this movie so far have actually been pretty awesome. The late 90s was kind of this amazing era where visual effects weren't really affordable yet. So people were all in on practical effects that had just been perfected for decades of filmmaking. And so even in a low budget movie like this, it looks really good. Quentin here is starting to assume that their jobs give them a function within the cube to get out. Cop, doctor, escape artist, but then the other two are a student and an office worker. This girl's name is Eleven, which is funny just this many years before Stranger Things. So she's some sort of mathematician and they're checking whether or not rooms are prime numbers and the pattern seems to be that prime numbers are trapped. So now we're having this sort of trippy montage of them just going through the motion of trying to move through rooms. They're estimating they've been in here nearly half a day already. There's this far off rattling as if like a train were going by overhead. Ren noticed it before he died. And he claimed that it seemed to be happening at fairly regular intervals. So that's another one of those lingering unknowns that I'm waiting to come back up. Oh, they just added more people. Ain't that fun. They're, who knows how deep into this thing. They've been moving for a long ways. There's no way these two started anywhere near the rest of them. Just the one guy. There was some confusion with him falling through the hole and colliding into people. Hmm. This portrayal is starting to dip a little bit into simple Jack territory. She's thinking that this is government or military, and he thinks it's more of just rich people messing with them. So basically he thinks they're in some sort of squid game scenario. <laughs> That's actually a pretty good fake out where they made it seem like the room was gassed, but she just choked on her button when she jumped down. It don't look prime to me. That your two bits worth? Worth? For what it's worth. <laughs> that was actually a very funny little exchange. How did this happen without him noticing? Oh, that was actually pretty sick. They're starting to get super paranoid of one another, especially Quentin of Worth. He feels that Worth set him up and encouraged him to go into the trapped room. If they were specifically selected to be contributing a set of skills towards this overall escape, it seems like losing the escape artist so early was a pretty devastating loss. Oh, even just here you can start to see that her lips are all chapped. They're dehydrated, they're starting to snap, and they're just kind of getting unhinged here and we're only like a third of the way through the movie. They just look like exhausted shit. The previous prime number thing didn't work out so now the Velma Eleven, that was her name. Eleven has to figure this out. Which makes me feel that Eleven is the most valuable one here right now by a mile because she has to figure out what the system actually is. I like the idea that Quentin actually just kind of low-key interrogated some key information out of Worth. Turns out he was contracted to design the outer shell that contains all of this, but he has no idea about the inner workings of it. Nobody knew what it was. Nobody cared. Bullshit. You knew from square one. You knew from cube one, you mean, Quentin? You do one little job. You build a widget in Saskatoon. And then <laughs> Saskatoon. Yeah, this is definitely Canadian. <laughs> this lady's bubbling over paranoia is actually incredible. It's very well portrayed. 
I like the theory that this is just a pointless public works project that effectively got lost in the shuffle. A million different contractors just took on an easy job. Nobody knows who the hell's in charge of it and now it just kind of exists. I don't know if that's what it'll end up being, but I like the way that that underplays the maliciousness of this, even though it's actively trying to kill everyone. 26 rooms high, 26 rooms across, so 17,576 rooms. Using Worth's information, we have an approximate count of how many cubes there are. But realistically, the only way out is going to be on the exterior, so you know you always need to be working your way outward. So the numbers aren't just some sort of secret code, they're actually grid points in three-dimensional space. I actually really like the fact that the buttons themselves are square. I didn't really think about that before, but that's a, a funny little detail. Oh well, yeah, I don't think you want to go into that one. This is one of the few rooms that shows them how directly unsafe it is before actually going into it. Now that they realized it's a grid system and not the whole prime number thing, I actually have no idea how they're deciding which rooms are and aren't safe to go into. They've made it to the edge here now, presumably, and it seems to be that every conceivable edge room is trapped. Quentin wants them to cross the room that gets triggered by any sound whatsoever. Quentin wants to leave this guy behind because he keeps making random noises and things. He's a bit of a liability. So they can't even climb into this room. It's below them so they have to somehow lower themselves into it utterly silently. They've been climbing around in this thing for like a day at this point. This is going to be brutally hard. I would have done far more tests to see what sort of decibel level would actually set this thing off. Why are they all carrying things in their teeth? It just seems way more prone to dropping than most other options. Don't go two at a time. What do you- that's, there's no reason for that added risk. This guy's actually going a different direction. I'm very curious if he knows something no one else does. Not just in this room, like in general. So his pant leg got caught and rotated the bottom floor one about three quarters of the way around. This has been very tense. No one has said a word in like three minutes. It's kind of, it's really well done. Oh, the floor one's rotating on its own. That was easily the best scene in the movie so far. That was so tense. I really enjoyed that. The cop in this group, Quentin, kind of emerged as the de facto leader, but he's slowly and steadily becoming the most unhinged one. He beat the shit out of Worth, and he's just kind of laying threats left and right. I don't think in 97 there would have been a lot of movies that are leaning anti-cop, and I don't think that was the intent here. But watching this 20-some years after release, yeah. Yeah, the cop is kind of emerging as the bad guy here. They really picked this room randomly. The process of using the prime numbers seems to have gone out the window. I, I don't know what they're doing anymore. Oh, would you look at that. So Worth was fairly certain that there was one cube's width worth of a gap between the actual cubes and this exterior, and that's seemingly what they've found now. This is actually a really good shot. I just thought that was gave a, a, an interesting vibe. Oh, so the names on their jackets aren't actually their names. We just learned that Worth and Holloway, is that her name? They're David and Helen. So they tied all their clothes together and they're just gonna dangle her on out of the room and, and see if they can figure out anything? Maybe they should have been committing really hard to working their way down so that they didn't end somewhere just in the dead middle of this insane thing. So now she's trying to swing outwards towards the plain, empty, nothing wall. Doesn't seem to be achieving much of anything. Oh, shit, good catch, Quentin. Guy's a beast! Hmm, Buddy either just lost his mind or he was just uh, running an experiment there. But the cold turn on his face was, was really icy and intense. The cool thing is that to film this, they really only had to build like two of these rooms to continually move from one to the next and then just change the lighting. All right. One hour. How the fuck are you going to know how long an hour is? <laughs> Hours as long as I say. Some real big brother energy there, and hours as long as I say. <laughs> There's actually a cool thing with this little montage where I probably can't actually include the music, but that guy hitting himself in the head is kind of creating the percussion of this weird trippy soundtrack during this sequence, and it's really blended together in a cool way. They're down to one boot. Quentin has fully cracked, and while everyone was taking a rest, he snuck off and kind of half kidnapped Eleven. 
<laughs> Wait, what the hell? Oh my god. Okay, so Quentin just clubbed him in the head. Uh, he already had a hit head injury. Is that somehow the same head injury? Are they uh, in some sort of loop? Okay, all the following uh, shit kicking is totally new, though. I, I that I, I'm discarding that theory very quickly. <laughs> Uh, they did somehow end up back in one of the rooms they started in, though. It's funny that Quentin is the one who had the theory that they all had a purpose in this, and he just decided his purpose was leader, when realistically he has contributed, like, nothing, and they're all starting to recognize it. So every time they're hearing that ridiculous industrial grinding thing that I thought was a train, the cubes are rearranging. It's actually kind of awesome trying to watch them problem solve this while they're all just disoriented, dehydrated, angry, frustrated, paranoid. She has figured out that at its starting position there is technically a bridge. And so now they have to figure out how many permutations of this thing rearranging it would take for that to end up back in its starting position. This reminds me of like Futurama where they would create mathematical equations for the purpose of resolving a crazy body swapping episode. I'm so curious if someone with an actual math degree worked on this to work out what this solution would be. So now they have two more moves before everything is back in its starting position. We have this really excellent ticking clock hanging over us. And she has figured out what the actual code is to finding safe rooms. Two. I was wondering if this guy was going to have like a Rain Man moment where he is actually the one who's supposed to be figuring out the numbers. Quentin stupidly chucked their boot in frustration earlier, so they have no real way to check these rooms. So his new solution now seems to be chucking worth from room to room. They all started in different rooms though. There was no real guarantee that they were all going to end up together. Oh, good job, worth. For a second it seemed like it was an accident, but they're totally trying to cut Quentin out because he's just a maniac and he's trying to kill everyone. They're just trying to put as many rooms between them and Quentin as they can now, but they got to figure out on the fly whether or not they're trapped. That was actually a sick little trap that they set for him. Not at all how I thought that was going to play out. So this should be it. This this should be the bridge falling into place. They've seemingly done it. Quite suddenly, mind you. Okay, but then everything moved again, like, instantly with no warning, whereas it's been on a very regular cycle prior to then. I guess maybe not every cube moves at the same time, and that was still part of the same rearrangement. Suddenly, Worth and Eleven are the only two we have left. Oh, but they can still hear Kazan crying. So now they're just blindly guessing rooms in an effort to try and rescue him. That's what I was waiting for. It seemed like they had reached the end way too easily. She stepped on a piece of glass from her glasses. Oh my god, so does that mean that the starting room was the way out? So then I gotta move back the last couple rooms, get back into one room together, and the next move will take them to the bridge. There have been less deaths overall in this movie than I expected, and, and less dramatic ones overall. So back to the starting room. This should be the way out if they've calculated everything correctly. You guys are wasting precious time. Get a move on. Holy. That seems like a good sign, doesn't it? Don't wait for everything to move again. For crying out loud, you're stressing me out. Don't sit down, Worth. He is bleeding out of some pretty major orifices, though. He might not be making it. They're not even really showing us outside. It's just this blinding light. Still, no real promise of safety, which is cool. Ah, uh, well, that was the same classic. If they didn't die on camera, then they're probably not dead. He clearly went through hell. Who knows how many traps he just blasted his way through to make it here. <laughs> that was kind of awesome the way they didn't show it. Just the gruesome remains. Honestly, it looks kind of weird the way that they keep showing like a single cube move. Whereas they established that this is kind of like an entire shifting amorphous blob of cubes, but that would have been much more complicated to animate. <laughs> Eleven, not eleven. Well, I didn't know that the entire time. The movie actually ends in a relatively uncertain place. I won't spoil it quite so specifically. I think the mystery, paranoia, uncertainty, all of that was done really well. The tagline for this movie was fear, paranoia, suspicion, desperation. Considering how confined the space of this movie is, I'm a little bit surprised they didn't play up the claustrophobia of it a little bit more. That's quite inherently present, but it didn't become a distinct separate plot point. 
I think the caricature of a Rain Man-like character perhaps didn't age especially well, but it's interesting that the stereotype of cops having all this anger just below the surface is something that still worked its way into this script, whether or not that was intentional. Generally, though, I found the performances to be quite strong. I thought in a low-budget thing like this, we'd have a bunch of amateurs, and they would kind of hold things back. But no, they did a great job with the material. I've actually seen this David Hewlett in a lot of things before. He commonly works with Guillermo del Toro. Quite a lot of these actors do still work. Not all of them but he's probably the most well-known. Okay, this is super funny. I'm just reading trivia about the movie, and the set's warehouse was near a train line, and that's the noise we're hearing. I said it sounded like a train. And that's what it is. They incorporated it into the movie and used that as the sound for the cubes rearranging. That's so funny. This director has done quite a few things since. This was his first movie. I think the one that would be next most well known is probably Splice. And he's done quite a lot of work in TV, including several episodes of Hannibal, which is just a phenomenal show. It's very interesting to me, though, that he never even remained on as a producer for the sequels. I don't think I have a ton to say about it. It's a very contained premise, executed quite simply but effectively. The practical effects were great. I genuinely appreciate that it was kept down to only 90 minutes. I think it was like a 7 out of 10 movie, I would recommend it. And I still find it genuinely interesting to see a movie like this coming prior to so many other things that clearly share that similar spirit, random strangers forced to share an environment, solve puzzles, escape together, or die. Maybe that's a generalized concept that exists even prior to Cube. But this entire trilogy released before even the first Saw movie. And so I think it deserves quite a bit of credit for its innovation. And what better way to make use of an innovative new premise? Milk it for a sequel. So let's push forward to Cube 2 Hypercube. <laughs> I, I didn't want to spoil it too early. How hilarious that subtitle actually is. So now, the second movie is directed by Andrzej Sikua, a Polish cinematographer who got his start way back in 92, working alongside Quentin Tarantino on Reservoir Dogs. Which is just a little bit funny to me, because throughout that entire first movie, I thought David Hewlett kind of reminded me of a young Quentin Tarantino, and there's a character named Quentin, so it I never said so, but it was stirring around in my mind the entire time. He went on to be the cinematographer for Pulp Fiction, so Tarantino clearly liked working with this guy. And I would say his next biggest credit is probably American Psycho. He only ever directed two movies, the first of which was Hypercube. We've got entirely different writers and producers. It is notably worse rated overall but I'll be really curious to see what somebody else did with this concept building off that in the original. I decided I would get a bit of sleep before starting this movie, so I put it off to the next day. I just did not have a good sleep last night. Now I'm over here chugging coffees, and you can all look forward to the brain-dead, confused ramblings of someone who is both overtired and over-caffeinated. It's bound to lead to some amazing insights. Not a lot of cube going on, but that is a very powerful opening shot. It's like a bunch of Dexter Morgan kill tables all lined up next to each other. It's funny, they have a zoom in on the eye once again, and it looks notably crappier than it did a couple years ago. Wow, this movie has a, a cheapness to it already. <laughs> If I'm reading correctly, the budget was four times more than the first movie, so a little over a million. But it sounds like it got a straight-to-DVD release. So the cube is much more aggressively lit this time around. Aw, oh, look, we get to see the origins of Spider-Man title credits. <laughs> They're even starting to turn blue. If any of them start turning red, this is low-key a Spider-Man movie. Other than that opening shot of people on the table, that was not a very good opening. It was far too indecipherable to have any level of intrigue, and it didn't even end on a cool kill. Hypercube! 
all this opening sequence has been drawn out like pen on paper and then it got kind of animated at the end and looks a little goofy, but that's kind of neat, I guess. Look at all those cubes. So many cubes. Not enough, really. I do love that there's a Peter block in the credits. That's just great. It's interesting that it's Cube 2.0, like it's totally recreated. So whatever the useless amount of money that was invested to create the original Cube, within the world of Cube, not like the budget of the movie, whatever sicko has designed this cuboid trap machine just decided, ah, we could do better, it didn't kill people nearly enough the first time. Ah, dang, he doesn't have his lunch even. <laughs> Oh, I guess, uh, also they haven't been stuck in prison uniforms or anything. The cube is notably bigger this time around. That is very tall, actually. So dropping down from this thing much more deadly suddenly makes navigating it just that much more difficult, let alone the killer traps. So this guy's a little unhinged, maybe a little paranoid, which is maybe a little justified. Well, other than the fact that that clearly looks like a fake knife, that's pretty intimidating, pointing straight at the eyeball like that. That was a cool bit of camera work, actually. And it was paired with this really disorienting sound of, like, people distortedly talking around them. It was very cool. This random guy is just popping in and out of the random doors, which is really neat, but uh, very unclear how he's doing it. The new touch style doors are also very cool. I, d I do think that's a good update. Oh, that was a cool reveal, actually. They're like trying to figure this out, and it seems that this time around, every time you move to a new cube, the cube is no longer positioned where it was previously. Some sort of instantaneous rearrangement happening, maybe? That's really cool. I even enjoy the music while she takes a minute to look around and kind of just think to herself like, what the fuck is going on here? So this movie definitely hasn't lost me yet. So far, pretty cool. They stick a blind girl in here this time? Just blind. Yep. Straight up. So seemingly no one has learned that these rooms are deadly yet, because they're all talking about just freely moving between rooms for an extended period of time. So they all are using their actual names now. That's, okay, totally different rules this time around. Very intrigued all of a sudden. What in the shit? How'd you guys manage to do that? Move quicker, Ned Flanders. Okay, everyone we've met is now together in a room. Giving them proper costumes actually allows the characters to be a little bit more quickly personified. The military guy is the one who gave up first, eh? So this guy was beaten and tortured before being hung up, apparently. Sasha, the blind girl, is convinced that something is chasing them. Just a sweet old lady. <laughs> this lady thinks she's just spun around in her local gym. Honestly, no one is freaking out nearly enough. I guess Sasha, but otherwise they're all just chatting as if they're having a f neighborhood block party together and all just meeting the neighbors. You don't happen to know why you're here, do you? Oh dear, I was never very good at philosophy. <laughs> I mean, that's quite a funny answer, but like, what is the vibe this movie is trying to hit right now? Because it's not horror. Some sort of weird visual ripple through the screen there, not a clue. Maybe we're in hell. Quite the leap in logic there, Mrs. Paley. The first one had rules. <laughs> the first one, what are you talking about? The first one. This guy's been in one of these things before. Well, that's a strange bit of visual effects nonsense, isn't it? So now they have to run away from this weird little wiggly wall thing? It honestly seems like the wrong direction for this franchise to have gone from practical effects. I'm not going! What, what you do that for? You mean this? Yeah. No! What you do that for? <laughs> that's the second time he's been asked that. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't have locked yourself to that wall. The way is the key. He ate the key. He's a lost cause. He's not even trying to move his legs. What are you trying to save? No, you're not allowed to choose to lock yourself to here and then grab onto her for help. You made this choice, you dumb old man. She saw like an interesting little after image of herself across the way. Not sure what that would have been. Oh, it's just going to keep pushing through maybe you guys should go you know perpendicular to it rather than straight away from it they've decided that they've fully escaped the moving crushinator and are now in only their 10th room not that crazy oh so the old lady has dementia or something she doesn't remember kate already 
Oh, so we once again have someone within the cube who technically worked on the cube. This guy made the touch sensors for the doors. Oh, he didn't just work on doorways. He worked on doorways tied to quantum teleportation. No big deal. Just rumors. Who knows for sure? A what? Well, a, a, a hypercube, a, a four-dimensional cube. Four dimensions. Yep, yeah, well, all the elements are there. I mean, uh, rooms repeating, rooms folding in on themselves. We're going through the usual paranoid theory crafting of whether this is military or a twisted game show. Oh, yes, yes. In a hypercube, there could be 60 million rooms. No, she, she could be right. <laughs> yeah, we'll just take this old lady at face value. She hasn't just been rambling nonsense 99% of the time. Oh, they've found one more person. Oh, yeah, that's pretty cool, though, that now there are differing gravities within the rooms. Jesus. She needs help. The gravity shift. She may be hurt. Wow. The overall level of acting in this is not great, and this actor has been fine up until that delivery. Jesus. She needs help. The gravity shift. She may be hurt. Wow. I mean, if everything is teleporting and shifting every time you guys move between rooms, you should not be splitting up. That's a cool shot too, actually. The way they're playing around with the spatial aspect of things is pretty cool. Like, this is pretty neat. For them, they're going sideways, and for her, she's going downwards. When they're so capable of doing interesting, practical things like that, I don't know why you would make this sliding CGI blob wall that dissolves things. I guess because CGI was new and everyone was just excited to have a crack at it. <laughs> Everyone's telling us about their lives right now, and the way in which they're editing it is reminding me of something very specific. We have an engineer, a therapist. He claims he's a consultant, but clearly it's security something or other. This kid is a game designer. Sasha is a student. It showed her doing a bunch of mathematics, so probably that'll be important. The old lady is an old lady. And the new girl is an attorney who's rich and parties too hard. So now Jerry just found that a duplicate of his watch exists in here. Further intrigue. Another gravity shift and another straggler found in another room. Here with lots of stuff written on the walls. Oh, so he's he's dead as shit. He's just rotting here. Multiple people can recognize this quantum physicist? Ah, so he just stinks like hell. He's not dead. Nope, never mind. He's dead. Mrs. Paley's looking for her stupid little dog. Her dog is named after a weapons manufacturer, and multiple of them know that. Yeah, she was a theoretical mathematician. I kind of figured she would be the secret brains. That was kind of the same trick the first movie played. Is it possible that you worked for Eyes On Research Affiliates and your dog's name was Skippy? <laughs> That's pretty funny. I'm not crazy, and I'm not hard of hearing either. I was intense, Mrs. Paley. I told you no one would believe me. That really undercut your credibility instantaneously there, Mrs. Paley. Oh, that's quite trippy then, isn't it? Oh. Well, that's the most horrifying this movie's been so far. They have to keep stopping and explaining things to Sasha as if she's not scared enough. As a hypercube is low-key a multiverse thing, just like two decades before that got super popular. I guess it makes sense why they moved away from the industrial design of the first cube, because now we're talking futuristic level stuff. The paranoia took a lot longer to set in in this movie. We're like 50 minutes in here. Hey Simon, where'd you get that knife, huh? It's mine. I collect knives. Weird thing to, to tell everyone about yourself at this time. These ladder trenches exist on every surface of this thing, and I'm just amazed nobody's tripping on the floor ones. I'm just waiting for them to reveal that Sasha isn't actually blind and she just thought it would be a useful defense mechanism surrounded by these strangers. They kind of introduced Grady as a little bit of the loose cannon unhinged one. One thing that worked really well in the first movie is that we were made to trust Quentin. And so his decline and fall off was fairly dramatic and kind of horrifying. Whereas here, I think the guy with the leather jacket and the knife is probably the one who's going to start knifing people. Call that profiling against knife collectors if you want. 
But I think this guy's earned a bit of a bad reputation. Mrs. Paley mentioned Alex Trusk. Max and Jerry both knew who that was, some hacker extraordinaire. Jerry doesn't believe that he's real. But during this montage, they're just spitting out every possible conspiracy theory they can. If you like the idea of a somewhat multiversal plot, where you're figuring things out alongside this group of people, you absolutely have to watch Triangle. It came out in 2009, phenomenal movie, a super fun watch, you're gonna be thinking about it for days. This movie is not moving along at a very good clip, so here I am thinking about something else. So here's the deal, I'm a private investigator. There we go, now we know what Grady actually does. Grady was sent to investigate a missing person, Becky Young, a name that was teased during the opening sequence, and she apparently worked for Izon, the same weapons manufacturer. Some weird little square just floating in the middle of the room. Oh, it's starting to do trippy dimensional things. It's hypercubing all over the place. So this random multi-dimensional bouncy ball is now cutting everyone to ribbons? This is such weird nonsense. It's a lot harder to care about the threat of this thing compared to a turret that shoots flaming acid in your face or whatever the other cube had. This thing is also incredibly inaccurate. It's like a DVD menu where it bounces around the screen and you're just waiting for it to hit the corner precisely. This thing's never hitting anyone. I mean, right up until it ate Jerry up like a blender. No, what are you doing, Sasha? Listen to her, that's what she wants you to do. Don't just start running around. Nobody in this universe wants to help themselves. They're all just a bunch of walking liabilities, aren't they? Kate's the only one who's actually helping anyone or getting anything done. <laughs> Who'd have thought that just waiting it out would be a viable option? Why wouldn't you just take the exit at the floor? That's obviously the easiest. Oh, I chomped up her glasses, that's so sad. Oh, so uh, great, Grady just decided to tie up Mrs. Paley. He's, he's fully lost it. I wouldn't say it was a very slow decline. I don't think you could really say as much when he was clearly so close to the edge to begin with. So uh, another weird random thing is just uh, pushing its way through the walls to kill them. He couldn't break free of this frail old woman's grasp, so he murdered her to get away. I think you, you could have tried a little harder. Get back here! But that's not how that's worked at any other point in time. Oh, they've entered the slow-mo room. Or the high-speed room? Unclear. Okay, pretty trippy, pretty odd. They keep finding 60659 everywhere with random other strings, values tied to it. Nobody remotely knows what it's for, though, yet. God, you know, I wish I was just smarter. That would help a lot, yeah. Very, very reasonable wish at this time. <laughs> I I don't know what's going on. Okay, they're all, the, okay. The gravity is different to the cube. Speeds are different. Totally, totally strange. There's a cool bit of relativity happening there, though. Holy shit! Variable time speed rooms. <laughs> the appropriate reaction. Yes. No, oh, they found another Jerry. This version of Jerry supposedly just woke up. Grady's making a move. Gonna give him a little smooch. In the interest of not spoiling the coolest thing this movie has done before, this room was fucked up. Some of the concepts that they're finding in this cube match the game that Max designed. I don't even know how to explain what's going on here. She works for Izon as a lawyer, sort of, kind of, and there's a lawsuit that Max is tied up in, so basically everyone in here is in some way tied to the cube. That's the gist of it. So Grady has now made it his mission to go room to room and seemingly kill every single Jerry he finds? Perhaps kill everyone, but so far he's only finding Jerry's. She tried to blow the whistle on them and then willfully chose to hide inside the cube that she knew was designed to murder everyone. Sasha is a nickname for Alex? I've never heard that before. Is that genuinely a thing? She is Alex Trusk? This movie is trying to introduce a lot of plot twists and none of them are that exciting to me. <laughs> the biggest twist of all, Max gets the girl. This is a weird thing to compliment this movie on, but that was kind of a legitimate cool sex scene because it played around with all these trippy time things and visuals and there was some nudity so I can't show it, but that was kind of cool. <laughs> Grady's just collecting these watches? You're, you're really drawing a lot of attention to yourself here, man. Becky Young, would you look at that? 
Oh, so maybe that was the first thing we saw, was her getting yanked into this room, not her being killed. I'm not totally checked out of this movie, it's doing some things quite well. Well, then, that, uh, that put an end to that storyline quite quickly, didn't it? They keep finding examples of people, versions of themselves, that have seemingly died in here, like, years ago. It's hard to know with the weird time stuff going on, but it's, it's pretty messed up. So seemingly these realities are collapsing on each other, and who knows what's about to happen. Wow, she took that knife away from him very easily. That quick edit was actually really cool. The second he got his eyes stabbed out, he appeared as an old man in the room. I don't know how he didn't starve to death or anything like that when that seemingly happened to so many other people. I think the movie is meaning to imply that he's been eating people to stay alive. Loading up on plenty of vitamin J. I don't really know how that worked. He absolutely should have seen that that's what she was doing. <laughs> Oh, the 606. So was the entire idea that that's only as long as they had to survive? Or is this thing gonna take them all with it when it implodes? This cube is much more mean overall. There's not really a puzzle to solve. You're just gonna die in here, it seems. Interstellar, eat your heart out. So there's kind of one more twist at the end, I guess, but it was wrapped up in a way that doesn't really answer any questions whatsoever and kind of leaves you in a rather unsatisfactory place. Yeah, that was worse than the first movie. <laughs> Who'd have thought that Hypercube wouldn't be as good as the original? I would say the acting was overall pretty inconsistent. There were a few bright spots, but nowhere near the overall quality we saw in the first movie. All of the deaths being done through these haggard, janky, new, yet old CGI looked like shit. There were like two half-decent moments of actual horror, but I don't think the continuous level of tension was really kept up the way it was in the original, and it gets so lost in the sauce trying to explain quantum nonsense of what they're all experiencing that it all detracts from the much more prevalent questions that are at the forefront of my mind. And because it doesn't attempt to answer any of those, it doesn't feel like this movie was concluded or working to set up a follow-up. There were a couple of good ideas on display, but I can't believe how slowly this 90-minute movie was paced. I don't know why that was. I don't know why it felt that way. Maybe it's because people kept going through these weird roller coasters of panic where they'd be seemingly on the brink losing their shit but then spend five minutes in the next room just chilly talking and getting to know each other, kind of trying to understand the cube, but kind of not really advancing anything, either our understanding or the plot. There is an alternate ending. This is the only quality I found it in. We'll see how different it really is. So in this one, it's much more explicit that this is the government, rather than eyes on, and that Kate was on a mission. She was directly a part of this the whole time. It's kind of a cool reveal that she was only in there for 6 minutes and 59 seconds. And we're told that she's the first operative to ever make it out of this alive. The alternate ending is probably a little bit better. It tells you the tiniest bit more, but still not a ton. But overall, this movie never really gave me that many characters to care about. It weirdly had about zero interesting deaths, maybe like one good one. Right at the end, they played around with the quantum multi-universe stuff in a few semi-interesting ways. But overall, I feel like they left a lot on the table. The movie failed to be as emotionally resonant or to have all the fun thrills that the original had. So I'm giving this one like a 4 out of 10. I didn't enjoy it that much. And while it was a five year gap between one and two, just two years later, they made Cube Zero. Weirdly, I recognize the poster for this movie. I kind of think maybe it appeared in DVD bargain bins around the country, because that feels really recognizable. This was again a straight to DVD movie, and apparently at the Scream Fest Horror Film Festival in 2004, it won Best Special Effects. So, I'm expecting a little better than what we saw in Cube 2. I'm gonna say right at the top here, 
I am extremely disappointed that they didn't call it Cube Cubed, or just call it Cubed. So rather fittingly, for me, Cube Zero is starting at a zero and is gonna have to dig its way out of that naming hole. This one is directed by Ernie Barbaresh, very fittingly staying with the tradition of this being the first movie he ever directed. He's actually a Ukrainian Canadian, which is kind of funny after I directly brought that up in the first movie. Ernie worked on the screenplay for Hypercube and is entirely responsible for this one. Combine that with it being the first movie he ever directed, and that doesn't instill a ton of confidence. But who knows, maybe Ernie is a little closer to the material, has some insights in how it should be done right, could bring something interesting to the table, and still surprise us with some surprising new ideas. So strap yourselves in, we're going on in number three. I'm actually surprisingly excited for this, more so than I thought I would be. But the first movie was quite good, and seeing the strange attempts to take the franchise in bold new directions with Hypercube makes me think that there's a lot of room for someone else to do something fun and interesting with a third installment. It's also funny to relive the glory of straight-to-DVD movies. I realize nowadays that just means it goes to a streaming service, but I think the average quality of these, like, million-dollar budget DVD movies is somehow actually shittier than the average quality of a cheap streaming movie. It really is just a, a tier all of its own. So, classic, we need to see someone first entering and exploring the cube. There's also a funny recurring thing that was also in the second movie, is to very early on establish someone is down to only one boot, meaning they've presumably been doing the boot method. What are these circles doing in my cube? Very non-thematic, if you ask me. Back to prison-style uniform, and a more industrial, less futuristic cube overall. He's down to one boot, but he seems to be moving from one room to the next with no real rhyme or reason. Is that not acid? Was it just like really cold water? Someone started the washing machine while he was taking his shower? Maybe fuel and now they're just gonna light him on fire? <laughs> water? Nope, straight up it's just water. Should have opened his mouth when they were spraying him, he's probably thirsty. Okay, not water, it's turning into goo directly on him. Oh shit, that was gruesome, oh my god. Oh, <laughs> that was horrifying! I'm so glad they went back to practical effects. So someone is actually watching this, that's the first time that's ever been pulled back and put on display for us. And that was potentially one of the most gruesome deaths in the entire franchise so far, like, well done, that was, that was nuts. And, Kind of awful. <laughs> Cube Zero. Although that actually has me wondering, maybe this is intended to be a prequel? Or it's just a name that sounded kind of cool in the early 2000s. So this one guy here is kind of questioning the situation, whereas the one he works with is seemingly drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit, and is pretty tuned out of what is happening here. Ah, oh, someone cleaned that fishbowl, that poor little guy. Here's a better look at their shared office space here, seemingly there's room for two more. Interestingly, these employees are also wearing that same style of name-tagged prison garb. They come for you at night. Who does? They do. Drop it. Do. Enough! What are you, suicidal? So these guys clearly don't really know what's going on. They're running this thing presumably because they have to, just completely in fear. Their lunch is just these pills? Pretty funny to say grace before eating your meal pill. All the messaging they're being sent is written in this weird cryptic shorthand. It's scanning through different available ID matches and kind of just implied that there are like dozens of people in the cube right now. They're using this weird little like Doc Ock arm remotely and they're reading her brain patterns, I suppose? A montage that seemingly shows that she had a chip implanted in her brain and also that she has a daughter. That's probably important. I don't know if this icon logo is again eyes on from the previous movie but it seems like she was kidnapped by i don't know like a cyborg compiling stress point so they're very specifically trying to mess with people's sore spots these guys are quickly just discussing the fact that they don't remember the last time they've been outside it's a long distant memory 
It's interesting to set up a layer of intrigue outside of the cube. All this time there's been these questions about who is running or operating or developing or putting people inside of the cube. So it's interesting to add an element that exists outside of it while still not really answering anything because they're also in the dark. I think that's well done so far. So you're back to needing to twist a handle rather than just a touch sensor. Okay, so one of the guys stuck in here has the tattoo on his forehead, but not the glowing green eyes. She found a handful of people in a different room. Not only did they not know how they got here, they don't even know who they are. There are traps. How do you know? Because of this? So <laughs> this guy's already lost fingers, so they, they know there are traps around. It's interesting to bring back the simplicity of throwing your boot, that that's just the obvious way to test these rooms. But I like that they added to the lore that they don't know their names, because in the first movie, once they got to know each other, they told each other their real names. But here, all they have to go off of is what's written on their shirt. Don't just stand there and watch this bar talk, run the hell out of here. Oh dear god, this is gonna rip him into pieces, isn't it? Holy shit, okay, that uh, was more elaborate than I expected. The sound design there was sickening. And again, practical effects, way better. So the one guy who works here is like a chess genius, I don't really know how much that's gonna factor into anything, but they've paid an odd amount of attention to it. I guess because the people in the cube are chess pieces in a sick game? There's a brewing paranoia between these two that the other two guys who work here have been taken away or eliminated in some way, shape, or form because they found a way out. So this one again has labeling between the different cube rooms, but not the same way as before. This is pretty cool, she's rubbing boot polish off onto a hairpin to be able to write this stuff out. Chess guy is also an avid drawer and now he can't help but keep drawing this main lady. So in the first movie they got out by waiting for everything to realign to a zero position creating that bridge. They've just established that when this iteration resets to its zero position, there's a clean sweep where everyone inside is instantly eliminated, so seemingly a no-win scenario. Now this one is a little bit different. They are commas instead of periods separating the letters. Oh, the funny thing is is that with letters, we now know this thing is 26 by 26 by 26, which I think is the same dimensions as the first cube. I like the idea that people emergently come up with similar strategies, like now they are taking turns moving through the rooms, which is something that I distinctly remember from the second movie, I'm not sure about the first. Instant freezing room? Pretty deadly. These filing cabinets are filled with people's files. So many that there are numerous R cabinets for their last names. So there are dozens if not hundreds of people who have gone through this. Now they've established the idea of trials and pink consent forms and Reigns, the main character, does not have a consent form. And this newspaper article is showing she is a political protester. So if they're talking about trials and dressed in prison uniforms? Is it possible that only people in this cube, other than the main character, chose this to get out of facing a life sentence or some such prison time? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> there's a purpose and there's a plan, and I'm not so stupid as to think there's no plan just because I don't understand it! Okay, I really like that. These guys have justified their employment here thinking that everyone inside is criminals, and now that's all being called into question. They have this dusty phone under lock and key to call the people upstairs. Now they got a call before they could make a call. They just got word that someone is at the exit. We don't know if that means the exit to the cube or, or what. So the guy in the glasses assumes it's a mistake that the lady is in here without a consent form, and is kind of strong arming his buddy to let the higher ups know about it because two of them are needed to do this exit procedure and it's confirmed that the guy who's nearly made it out of here is their other co-worker. Honestly cube and cube zero together are pretty great maybe people should just skip hypercube. <laughs> well the exit just wandered into a big empty white void. Honestly more horrifying than in the first movie where there was some indication that there was a way out. This is kind of harrowing. We also now know that this guy who's been stuffed in here has had his memory wiped as well. He has no memory of working for this place. Well, holy shit. That exit interview didn't seem especially fair. Oh, 
that's just awesome. <laughs> it's horrifying, but it's awesome. That is such a crazy bit of imagery. So they just incinerated their co-worker pretty hard to justify this position now. This elevator literally only has up and down. So presumably he just submitted himself to be within the cube, right? <laughs> yeah, you should have seen that coming. So in the past, we've had people in the cube who unknowingly contributed to its construction. Now we have an actual employee of the cube entering it. Earlier, they were impressed that the protagonist lady actually recognized that there were letters and decided to try and map them. So presumably, this guy knows the system. Oh, this is what we are familiar with from the first movie. That was the entrance cube, and now it's gonna go scramble him up somewhere inside the center of it. Somewhere, I don't know, inside the center of it. So now a bunch of suits have come down to see Dodd. So now they have to track their own employee that they just shoved inside the maze without an implant. Oh, come on, what's with all this cybernetic stuff? You didn't want to give your other employees access to that sort of tech? See, this is good use of CGI to just have a bunch of computer mumbo jumbo don't use that for the actual traps okay so he's using the letter system that he knows to determine which rooms are safe he's moving through things pretty confidently this group just experienced their first instance of this thing shifting around them so this girl is now separated from the group nice toe ring their jellio is that what your name was they pricked her bare foot with some needles in the floor and now she's kind of tripping balls a little bit oh this is cool the same way that he's foreseeing the chess movements he's seeing the way the rooms are rearranging and using that to track reigns they just found a corpse here and are confronting the reality that maybe people just starve in here sometimes Seemingly through dumb luck, they managed to find their missing companion. I would say this is the overall goriest of the three movies. That was pretty, pretty horrifying. Military guy with a tattoo on his forehead has been complaining about a headache and claims it went away basically as soon as she died. She scratched this guy and now he's just deteriorating in front of them. So they're losing members of this team pretty quickly. They're compromised for bringing him along with them as he presumably is near death is to just go to every room first. Ah yeah, maybe, maybe we don't go down into that room. Well, there is well and truly no good reason to push him down into that. She identified this guy as a bad guy instantaneously, and apparently she was just fully correct in that. Seems a little unfair to kind of double kill this guy. Oh my god. <laughs> Wow, okay, that was pretty brutal. If what you like out of movies like this is crazy, over-the-top, practical effect deaths, then Cube Zero is the one for you. So Wynn managed to catch up with these other two and confirm that they probably should have ditched that guy. It was a very contagious, flesh-eating virus. And he just confirmed that there are numerous cubes. Even if they're just rumors, that's a fun way to tie in the other two movies somewhat passively. They say you're all condemned prisoners who volunteer for the experiments instead of facing the death penalty. There we go, that clears that right up, except for the part where their memories have all been wiped clean. Ah, so they've now confirmed that that brain scan that they were doing was basically reading these subjects' dreams. Those are very elaborate drawings, Win. So there's this mysterious third exit coming back up again that none of them know about. Much earlier in the movie, these two employees established that there were rumors of a third exit. Well, that's not a great sign. Maybe, maybe don't go into that one. Oh, well, that's seemingly something that the higher-ups are doing to stop Wynn from simply showing them how to walk out of here. They're pulling up the current trap configuration, which is kind of cool to show. As if the cube being designed to work against them wasn't enough, now there's a team full of people actively trying to make it even harder. It's a good way to raise the stakes. <laughs> The Swiss cheese boot is a pretty good visual. <laughs> yeah, it didn't really work out how he intended, I don't think. Further confirmation that there is now a tier above these guys still. It goes all the way to the top. The higher-ups are basically saying screw this and their plan is to just nuke everyone out of the cube now. Yeah, that seems a little bit like a no-win situation. Seems like they were just standing in some very fortunate positions. Oh, is Dodd hacking trying to protect them? 
When these three guys specifically work together and things are going wrong, they immediately question Dodd as they should, but they also gave up on that line of inquiry sooner than they should have. The power supply is cut off and everything is now resetting, presumably further interference from Dodd. And every door opened at once? Oh my god, you just have like an infinite hole to fall through? They now have 10 minutes before it flash incinerates every room. So they will very temporarily have a bridge, then it'll wipe everyone out. Three seconds. <laughs> Brilliant, one second each. You guys gonna toss yourselves through those exit tubes like a couple of pole vaulting Olympians? Oh wow, he's really just going to town on this thing. Eat it, Dodd. Eat the little thing. Yeah, that was, that was the correct move. I mean, they're gonna cut you open to get it. But in the short term, that was the correct move. <laughs> that was kind of cool, actually. That was some James Bond shit. Yeah, yep, that's exactly where I thought that was gonna go. We're down to five minutes until reset. Keeping the clock in view through that conversation was kind of great. The bad guys are equally on their back foot right now trying to find a way to put a stop to this. So the ticking clock is equally relevant to them. Seemingly they're just gonna blow the chip in his head. Well, now you guys have a second and a half each to jump through the hole. Oh cool, it's like a sleeper agent thing. There's been a recurring thing in these movies where someone inevitably turns on the group, and the idea of manufacturing that rather than someone's psyche just breaking is a good way to still include it as a trope without just retreading the exact same ground. So now they have a super soldier chasing them through the maze. Ah, he doesn't have super nads though. Crush those same as any old boy. Okay, now throw him down the infinite open door hallway. That'll just be too satisfying. I don't know what sick part of me wanted to see that so badly, but I'm, I'm quite disappointed that they didn't do it. So they've made it back to the room that should reset to the bridge position. And they found the other missing employee. Which is cool that they found him in another one of these starting rooms, because it means every employee who's ended up in here nearly made it out. The super soldier concept is really cool and completely completely underutilized. Nope, never mind, that was dope. Classic, if they didn't die on camera, they didn't die rules. Wow, that was efficient. And now they have to swim their way out? Who knows how far? The incineration process is so intense that they actually couldn't even see video of whether or not it worked. I don't really understand how the auxiliary exit was attached to the same room that one of the main exits is on. But eh, whatever, they made it out. Good for them. Too bad they're immediately being hunted again. <laughs> oh my god, the people hanging in the background? What the hell? This one-eyed villain is hamming it up super hard, but I kind of enjoy his performance. And just like that, memory wiped and dropped into the cube. <laughs> That's actually so smart. It adds a layer to the character in the first movie, where he's had his brain so utterly and completely fried that he barely even has any mental faculties left, let alone a memory of this place. That's actually really interesting, and seemingly explains something you didn't really know you ever wanted explained. Zero the fish as himself, that's too good. Overall, yeah, that was pretty great. I would say on par with the first, maybe a little below. The added layer outside of the cube was super fascinating, but it came at the cost of getting to know the group inside the cube, watching them kind of fall apart and eat each other from the inside out. Although, you know, maybe less literally than Grady and Hypercube. It probably had some of the best deaths overall. I would say you could watch the original Cube and Cube Zero, and it serves as a pretty solid pair of horror movies. I'm less confident in Hyper Cube. The poorly aged VFX and overall lower quality of acting sort of drag the franchise down into a low point, but considering these movies are only 90 minutes each, then hey, maybe you do just want to watch all three. I know you now know the broad sweeps and general plot points of these movies, but I tried my best to leave out many of the actual kills and surprises that would hopefully still make these movies worth watching independent of this video. I've heard that the Japanese remake is not that good, and I'm running out of time to get this out in time for Halloween, so I don't think I'm actually going to be watching that this year. 
And the Wikipedia indicates that they're exploring the option to reboot the Cube franchise. And in the event that they make a brand new Cube movie, I would happily make a standalone video on that. I'd be very curious to see how they update it. Considering we've now had entire franchises and globally popular series like Saw and Squid Game, the popularity of those and looking back at what did and didn't work would surely come back around and influence the direction of a new cube. You could take the foundations laid with this trilogy, mix together with some modern updates, taking lessons from those other series, especially the importance of developing the characters. So if the right person were to come along and they keep the budget down around like 5 million, I think a new cube could be kind of amazing. I'm including less between movie commentary than I did when watching Final Destination, because these movies are a little more straightforward. There's just less to say. You're trapped in a cube, some people died, some people made it out. Rinse and repeat. But if they can make 10 Saw movies and have the 10th movie be one of the highest rated ones in the series, then there's absolutely room out there for a Cube reboot, and one that could be done really well. Before committing to the Cube trilogy, I compiled quite a list of horror franchises that I could maybe visit. I chose this one because it was a Canadian trilogy. That appealed to me because it's both a short series I could get through quickly. And yeah, I want to support Canadian filmmaking. But if you have suggestions of your own for horror franchises you'd like to see me cover in a similar manner, drop those in the comments and I will absolutely keep it in mind for next year. I'm open to just about anything. For the sake of this series of videos, I probably will end up leaning a little closer to horror that has some fun mixed into it. But who the hell knows, if, if someone gives me a brilliant suggestion of a straight up horror that is appealing for some other reason and I just can't say no, then sure, why not, I might go for that. Thank you all so much for watching, it's a fun little switch up for me to do this once a year and I hope it's enjoyable for you all as well. Thank you so much for watching, happy Halloween, and I hope to see you again soon. I'm not going! What, what you do that for? You mean this? Yeah. No! What'd you do that for?